It's good to be back with you. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful that we can spend this time together, even by video. We're grateful for the students who have uh, taken these two years out of their lives to uh, faithfully study your word day after day. And so our prayer for this class as we open up your word and we look at some of the ancient Near Eastern peoples uh, and the gods that they serve, that you would bring into focus and into clarity the truth uh, that you are the one true God and you are the only one who is worthy of our worship. And so, Father, our prayer is that you would redeem this time, that it would be instructive and helpful as we continue to pursue the truth as we look into your word. We ask your blessing, the presence of your spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth, and that you would be honored and glorified uh, in the time that we spend together. Father, our, uh, we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is good to be back with you, and we're going to look uh, again at another people group, again in the ancient Near Eastern uh, people. The Bible focuses on Israel, but many other nations intersect uh, with Israel. And uh, today we're going to look at the Ammonites. Uh, last time together we looked at the Moabites. And so the Ammonites and the Moabites are very closely linked, uh, closely related, and uh, we're going to look at them together. Before we go there, I want to remind you how we started this class, and that is that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, that God makes a covenantal promise with Abraham. And he promises that uh, through Abraham and his uh, wife Sarah, that ultimately they're going to have a nation that's going to come from them. Again, they had no children at the time of this promise and wouldn't have children for another 20 five years. But nonetheless, God would make a nation. He would bless those who blessed him, uh, who blessed them. He would curse those who cursed them. And through Abraham, through this nation, all the peoples of the world would be blessed. And I suggested to you that that is an international plan. That is, God's goal was to reach the nations. And so as we study other nations, they all matter. Every one of them matters to God. And even though the spotlight of the Old Testament is on primarily the nation of Israel, we will see as we uh, encounter the Ammonites today that they too matter to God. If you were with us uh, last time and have already looked at the, the, uh, uh, our time together on the Moabites, uh, the Ammonites have a very similar history. Um, and, and so we'll just talk about them briefly here. First of all, their location. Um, we see Moab here on the east side of the Dead Sea and above them Ammon. And, and the Moabites and the Ammonites, uh, their borders change throughout the history of Israel. So we'll see them a bunch of different ways. Uh, here's uh, one particular uh, map of the them. Uh, here's another one showing Ammon really quite small and well pushed back from the Jordan River. At some times their land extends all the way to the Jordan River and all the way down to the Moabites. So uh, their land moves from time to time, but they are another one of those nations that are on the right side or on the east side of the Jordan River. If you're doing extra studies, sometimes you'll see the term Transjordan, and that means the other side of the Jordan River or the east side. And so the Moabites are a Transjordan people, the Ammonites are a Transjordan people. They're on the other side of the Jordan River, the Jordan River flowing north south or, or flowing south from the north from the Sea of Galilee down into the Dead Sea. So that's uh, another people. Just a reminder of how it started. I'm not going to reread these passages, but in Genesis 19, when we studied Moab together, we recall the story of Lot just after the incident of Sodom and Gomorrah, where God brings judgment on the tremendous immorality in Sodom and Gomorrah. And in the process, uh, Lot's wife looks back when she's told not to look back and is turned into a pillar of salt. And so Lot and his two daughters flee and really live in fear from this point on. And, and so in the fear that they live, they're in the mountains, they're hiding in a cave and so on, and the Lot's daughters realize there's no way to pass on the lineage of Lot. And so the idea then becomes... <clears throat> Uh, the idea becomes, uh, for, from the eldest daughter, we will get our father drunk, we will sleep with him, we will get pregnant, Lord willing, and we will pass on uh, his name. And so they do that. You'll recall, again, in Genesis 19, we read it together, uh, our last time together, they... Uh, um, uh, they both get pregnant, the older daughter and the younger daughter. The older daughter gives birth, and her son she names Moab, and out of that come the Moabites. And the younger daughter gets pregnant and gives birth to a son, and she names him Ben Ammon. And, and so they become known as the Ammonites. 
And uh, so they both settle in the land God gives to them, probably not too far from where Lot was, Lot, Lot was uh, uh, hiding in the caves or, or withdrawn from Sodom and Gomorrah. Today it would all be part of the modern kingdom of Jordan. And uh, uh, th this land would be, like I said, divided up and moved in several different ways. I want to give you a couple of passages that we'll just briefly look at, and then we'll get into some more significant text. Uh, the first is, uh, again, this warning. If you remember, Israel uh, ultimately is going to go into Egypt by the end of the, the book of Genesis. They'll be in Egypt some 400 years. God will raise up Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. They get enslaved in the process. We looked at that in our very first class classes together in Egypt, and then they make their way to the promised land. You'll remember there's 40 years of wandering in the desert because of uh, uh, sin of unbelief and trusting God, and eventually they will make their way to uh, the promised land under Joshua. But if you know the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is still under Moses, and it's kind of right at the end of Moses' life, and it's a 40-day sermon challenging these younger generation, the generation kind of born and raised in the 40 years of wandering in the desert, it's challenging them, will you obey God? Will you trust God to deliver you into uh, the promised land? And so we pick up that story at the very beginning of this 40-day sermon, the book of Deuteronomy is kind of, uh, Deuteronomy is, a, is a, the second giving, Deutros is second and Namos is law, Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. And, and so in Deuteronomy chapter two, in this, sent, in this sermon that God God is speaking through Moses, um, we read this to the Israelites. Again, they haven't yet conquered the land, but God is going to give them the opportunity now that the unbelieving generation has died off. And so God says this through Moses, when you come to the Ammonites, the people we're about to talk about, uh, do not harass them or provoke them to war, for I will not give you possession of any land belonging to the Ammonites. So you're going to go into the land, but you don't get the Ammonite land. Kind of interesting. I have given it as a possession to the descendants of Lot. You'll, of course, remember that the Ammonites are descendants of Lot. And so, again, these daughters had a good idea in wanting to preserve the family line, which was considered noble in those days, and, and, and even so today. And yet, their methodology of this incestual relationship was, of course, abominable to the Lord. And yet, the Lord is... Well, the Lord is in some ways blessing the results, even though he's not condoning the sin. Um, Deuteronomy goes on, that too was considered a land of the Raphites. That's kind of the people who were there before the Ammonites, who used to live there. But the Ammonites called them Zamzamites. Uh, and they were people strong and numerous, as tall as the uh, Anakites. The Lord destroyed them from before the Am Ammonites and drove them out and settled in their place. And so this is an example of my illustration of the spotlight and the floodlight. In two verses there, we find out that the Lord had been working amongst the Ammonite people and had given them a land and had driven out the people who used to live in the land so that they could have the land. And the Bible kind of mentions that in passing. We don't get the detail. We get the detail on Israel. But in this case, we just find out that, again, God cares about them as well. And God longs to redeem these people. And Israel needs to serve as an example uh, to the Ammonites to ultimately uh, bring about salvation. So we get that little note early in Deuteronomy. I want to get a, another uh, note that we're going to grab from the book of Judges, and then we're going to get into some more specific texts that help us to uh, learn about um, uh, that help us to, to to learn about the Ammonites and and their uniquenesses. Uh, this text we also looked at when we looked at Moab, and it's from Judges chapter 3. And I just want to show you that often Moab and Ammon will work together, often in against uh, Israel or against the Lord's people. And again, there is this familiar... Uh, this familial connection, which is Abraham, out of his descendants come the nation of Israel, and out of Lot, out of his descendants come both Moab and Ammon. And so, uh, Judges chapter 3, verse 12, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave 
Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon again uh, came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. So the focus is on Moab and King Eglon, and of course, after 18 years, God raises up the left-handed judge Ehud, and we looked at that in the past. But just to note that joining Moab was the Ammonites, and the Amalekites. So again, often they work together for the destruction of God's people or for the torment of God's people and so on. And so when we talk about the Ammonites, we're often uh, talking about them hand in hand with the Moabites, and some of that makes sense in light of uh, what, we, uh, what we saw with their birth through the daughters of Lot. So the first passage I want to kind of focus on is a little later in the book of Judges where we see God who's going to use the Ammonites sort of to deal with the sinfulness of Israel. And so we'll pick it up in Judges chapter 10. So with your Bibles, let's go to Judges chapter 10. And we will uh, begin reading there, Judges chapter 10. Again, we've talked about Judges multiple times. We've got this cycle uh, that uh, uh, the Israelites continue to go through. A judge, again, is someone who inflicts judgment. So we don't picture a, a judge with a robe and a gavel making a, a judgment in, in, the, in a case, uh, a, a civil case. Uh, a judge is really a warrior uh, who, who then uh, inflicts judgment on the nations that are enslaving Israel. So we pick up the story, Judges chapter 10. We've gone through multiple cycles in Judges already by chapter 10, and we're going to see another one here that's going to involve the Ammonites, and hopefully that'll help to uh, give us a little insight into the nature of God and into the nature of the Ammonites and how this all works together. So Judges chapter 10, verse 6. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. I stop there just to remind you, we talked about this in previous classes, we have this ongoing play in both the Old and New Testament about eyes. And when we look at things, going all the way back to Eve in the garden, when she was told not to eat from the fruit, she looked at it and it looked pleasing to her. And so we see with our eyes, and our eyes are deceptive we don't always see things as they are. And so when the Lord looks with his eyes, we get perfect judgment or perfect righteousness. And so here again, we get this analysis, the same kind of analysis we get in the book of, books of First and Second Kings, we get this analysis. Again, Israel, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Whether they were doing evil in their own eyes, who knows? But in the eyes of the Lord, they were doing evil. They served the Baals and the Ashraths and the gods of Aram and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them. And so here again, we look at many of the gods and many of the nations we've already looked at, all these different gods, and you can kind of get the sense they're serving everyone. If you just want to kind of remember Aram's to the north and Sidon, that's the Tyre and Sidon, those are the Phoenicians. You'll remember Jezebel was a Sidonian, part of the Phoenicians, and they were Baal worshippers. And you remember, of course, Elijah and, and Mount Carmel and so on, that, uh, that showdown between the gods. The gods of Moab, which we looked at last time, that would be Chemosh and whatever other gods they were worshiping, the gods of the Ammonites. We'll find more uh, about them in a moment. The gods of the Philistines. Remember the Philistines? That's Dagon. And that's, you remember the story where they capture the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines do, and they take the Ark of the Covenant, sort of the representation of the presence of God, and they put that in Dagon's temple, and they come the next morning and find Dagon bowing down uh, before the Ark of the Covenant, and eventually hands cut off and feet cut off and so on. And uh, uh, so this is Israel again, worshiping every Everything and anything other than the one true God. Everything around them. And so notice how God uh, renders this. They forsook the Lord and they no longer served him. And he became angry with them. And that's just important again as we think about the gods of the nations and so on. We are always serving someone. 
even when we're serving ourselves, we are serving uh, someone who thinks, all right, God that wants us to think that we are uh, the most important and that we should be uh, the ones making all the decisions. We're always serving someone. And so when you serve the gods of sin, ultimately the gods of the nations, the gods of the world, whether we're talking about the Old Testament times or we're talking today, we're always enslaved to whatever they are. And so God offers to be enslaved to him and he is perfect righteousness. He is perfect love. Or we can be enslaved to someone else. And that's kind of the language that we're getting here. Um, they became, uh, uh, verse 7, he became angry with them. Uh, sorry, verse 6. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and they no longer served him, they served someone else. And so part of this course is to see that when you serve someone other than the one true God, whether we're talking about the Old Testament whether we're talking about 2019 or 2020, it's the same result. It's always an enslavement that is ultimately destructive. So the Lord becomes angry with them. He, he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites. The Philistines and the Ammonites. Back to a map just for a moment here. So the Ammonites, these are the people again to the east of the Jordan. And the Philistines are people right along the Mediterranean coast, just to kind of remind you. So now you've got nations both on the left and the right. That's really the point. On the left and the right, there are nations oppressing Israel. Israel is, if you will, squished in the middle. And I remind you of that because this is because of their sin. The results of sin is always disastrous. And that's what we see in these Old Testament accounts. It's why it's worth our time because it helps us to realize our sin does the exact same thing. And so he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan in Gilead and in the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites uh, also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. So we got the Ammonites who are on the east side of the Jordan, cross the Jordan, and come into Israel's land. This is what sin does. It oppresses, it enslaves, it crushes. And this helps us understand what it's like to worship God versus worshiping the gods of the nations. Again, 18 years, and Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, we have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. And so we have this time again where Israel needs to get out of this cycle that they're in, this cycle of oppression and, and so on. And so they finally confess we've sinned. We, we have done what is wrong because we have forsaken you. And as a result of forsaking you, you always end up serving someone else. And so you can serve what is evil, you can serve what is good, but you're always serving. And, and, and so the people are recognizing that serving the gods of the nations is oppressive, which is always what we're trying to show in this class, which is that the gods of the nations, no matter what name they take, no matter what they claim to be able to be and do, are always destructive. And uh, the one true God is the one who's always redemptive, always the one who delivers. And uh, so they confess their sin. I'll remind you of their sin. If you remember the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, the very first commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Chapter uh, 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. So God at the very beginning, giving them the law after he's delivered them from Egypt, before they ever get to the promised land, he says, here's the 10 commandments, the 10 rules, the 10 primary laws by which you need to live. And the first one is, don't put other gods before me. And now in Judges chapter uh, 10, the Israelites are confessing, we put other gods before you. We've broken the command. We've forsaken you. Verse 11, the Lord plot, uh, replied, when the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the uh, 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 Amalekites, and the, and the Moanites uh, oppressed you and you, uh, you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their hands? But you have also forsaken me and served other gods. So I will no longer save you. Go, cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. 
you see what God is saying, and we're kind of building to this, is over and over in all these classes that we've studied, all these different people groups, all these different nations, they cry out eventually because of the oppression of the other gods, and God saves them. And now God's, it sort of seems like he's fed up. No, nope, not going to do it. Why, why don't you cry out to the gods that you worship? Which, of course, is always the reminder that in the end, the gods of the nations don't do anything. We saw that in the big showdown with Elijah. That in the end, when you call to Baal and ask him to send fire, there's nothing to be sent. And so God says, no, I'm not going to save you. Verse 15, but the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and serve the Lord, and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. So they turned. And it's interesting that in the book of Judges, this is the most detailed account of Israel's repentance and turning back to God, getting rid of the foreign gods among them, always idols and images of worship and so on, and they got rid of them, whatever that means. They burned them, they got them under the camp, they buried them, they destroyed them, whatever it might have been, but they turned back to serve the one true God. And so again, the one true God gets pictured here in opposition to the other gods, the God of rescue and the God of saving. That's the characteristic we get of the one true God. He is the one who rescues. He's the one who saves. Ultimately, he is the one who responds. When the Ammonites were called uh, to arms and camped at Gilead, the, uh, the Israelites assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, whoever will take the lead in the attack, the Ammonites will head over, uh, uh, w- will be head Uh, excuse me, Uh, whoever takes the lead in the attack, the Ammonites will be head uh, head over all who live in Gilead. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead, his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown, they drove Jephthah away. All right, so now we're going to meet someone who God is going to raise up. And now we're going to start to see it's going to be a little more confusing because this person is born, uh, this person named Jephthah. He's from Gilead. Gilead's in Israel, kind of in the center uh, of Israel, not too far from the Jordan River. And uh, uh, Jephthah's from Gilead, and he's a warrior, and his father's name was Gilead probably named after the region in some way, shape, or form, and his mother was a prostitute. And so Gilead has sons, and um, his sons uh, uh, drove Jephthah away. Okay, So these, these are either brothers or stepbrothers, not exactly sure how that all goes, but they drove Jephthah away and said, you're not going to inherit Uh, you're not going to get any inheritance in our family because you are the son of another woman. I'm sorry, I said uh, they may have been uh, stepbrothers. They were stepbrothers. Again, Jephthah is from the prostitute. And so, uh, again, you can see the immorality. What happens when you worship other gods? Well, you start living immorally. This is why God has given us the moral code that he has given us. And you can see this has created all sorts of challenges within the family. So uh, Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Again, the Bible's being descriptive, helping us to understand. Not a gang, gang of good people at this point. He's been despised by his stepbrothers. He's the product of his father and a prostitute. And now he is uh, living in another land, the land of Tob. Uh, sometime later, the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, and the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commanders so we can fight the Ammonites. So this guy is a scoundrel. He's living away. He's living with scoundrels, but he's a good warrior. We've already learned that. And so now when they need him, now they want to go get him. The people of Gilead want to go get Jephthah. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now? Why uh, uh, now when you're in trouble? 
And of course, we all know this, but this story is, of course, a reminder of how we tend to work with God. This is how Israel worked with God. Israel despises God and worships other gods. They get into trouble, they get oppressed, and then they call for God, and God, will you help us? And it's kind of a mini story here with Jephthah. Jephthah was driven from his homeland, from Gilead, by his stepbrothers, and now all of a sudden, they're in trouble, and they call him back. Um, Jephthah said to them, didn't you uh, hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us and fight the Ammonites. Okay, the oppression is coming from the Ammonites again because of Israel's sin. And you will be, uh, and you will head over, uh, you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. He repeated all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with a question. What do you have against me and attack my country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's message. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from from the Arnon to the Jabbok rivers, the Arnon River, the Jabbok River, all in modern-day Jordan, uh, all the way to Jordan. Now give it back peaceably. Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king. So again, the Ammonites are saying, when you guys came up out of, out of Egypt and took the land, you took some of our land. And I already read you in Deuteronomy 2, they weren't supposed to take any of their land. God had preserved that for him. So we've got this interesting sort of uh, uh, conflict that we need to think about here. This is, uh, and here's the letter here from verse 14. This is what Jephthah says, Israel did not take the land of Moab, or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and on to Kadesh, which is all south of Moab, south of uh, Ammon. Uh, The Israelites sent messengers to the king of Edom, give us permission to go through your country, but the king of Edom would not listen, and sent you also to the king of Moab, and he refused, so Israel stayed at Kadesh. Next, they traveled through the wilderness and skirted the lands of Edom and Moab and passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab and camped at the other side of the Arnon. They didn't enter the territory of Moab, for Arnon was its border. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon. And he said to them, let us pass through your country uh, in our own place. Sihon, that's the king, however, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his troops and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and his whole army into Israel's hands and they defeated him. So you see what Jephthah is doing here is he's just reminding the Amorites, I'm sorry, the Ammonites of the history. Here's what happened. Here's exactly how it happened and why they ended up fighting and taking land uh, because ultimately they met opposition when they weren't looking for any opposition. Verse 21, Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon of the whole army into Israel's hands, and they defeated him. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. In other words, they end up with the land only because they were opposed by the people, and the people, the Amorites in this case, mounted an army under King Sihon, mounted an army to to destroy them, and ultimately God gave them into the into their hands. Now, since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out from out before uh, his people Israel, what right do you have to take it over? Will you not take what your God Chemosh gives? Okay, so Jabbok is saying the territories are determined by the gods. The God of Israel gave us this land, and the only reason we got this land, that was never our plan, we got the land because these people mounted an army against us. So God defeated them, we took their land, but only because they opposed us. We weren't trying to get them, we were just trying to march through and uh, onto our own land. And so now he says, doesn't your God have land for you? Uh, uh, appealing to Chemosh, who again is the Moabite god, who also serves as an Ammonite god. We'll meet another one here in just a little bit. 
but we see him mentioned. We talked about him our last time together when studying uh, Moab. Likewise, we pick it up in verse 24, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. You get what your God gave you, we get what our God gave us. That's the idea. Are you better uh, than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years, Israel occupied Heshbon, Aror, and the surrounding settlements, and all the towns of the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I have not wronged you, but you are doing me wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. And again, you see a specific passage that tells you what I've told you already, which is that battles are, are thought to be determined by the gods. And so Japheth is now saying, well, we'll let God decide. God gave us the land 300 years ago. Why are you saying that you need to get it back now? In other words, if this really was an issue, you should have been trying to get it back for 300 years. And so we have these kind of conflicts today where something's happened in the past and then some people want to roll the time back and go back to 200 years ago or 400 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Honestly, that's part of the Palestinian question in Israel, which is Israel had the land and then they were out of the land for uh, well over 1,000 years and, and then now they're back and, and whose land is it and who, how far back do you appeal and so on and so forth. It's the same type of issue. We pick up the story in verse 28. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah had sent him. The spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mezpah of Gilead, and from there advanced against the Ammonites. So very simply, um, Jephthah is, is, is uh, inhabited by the spirit and dwelled by the spirit, and he is moving east across the Jordan River into the Ammonite territory. That's what's being said here. And from there he advanced against the Ammonites. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of, out of the door, my, excuse me, whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. So Jephthah makes this vow. Again, it's very important to understand why these stories, these narratives are in the Bible. They aren't necessarily here because, uh, because every instance in them is wise and you should follow. This is an example of a warrior man who had been despised by his stepbrother, sent away, brought back, and now has said something that's really not wise. This is a not wise uh, idea, even though the Lord is with him. And, and so you get these blurry things. It's like when we talked about Samson. Samson was, was set up to be the deliverer of Israel and he was unfaithful and tried to be a Philistine rather than deliver the, uh, Israel from the Philistines and then God accomplished his purposes anyway. And so now we see this again with Jephthah. He, he's, he's indwelt by the Spirit of the Lord and yet he's saying very unwise things. God never asked him to say anything like that. Verse 32, then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gave them into his hands. So Jephthah, again, is a deliverer. He's a judge. He's a judge for six years. And what, does judges, what do judges do? They deliver Israel from the evil that oppresses them. And so Jephthah does exactly what you would think uh, that he would do in light of the Lord being with him. Verse 33, he devastated 20 towns from Aurora to the, to the vicinity of Mineth as far as Abel Kerium. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out and meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of tim timbrels? And she was his only child, except for her he had neither son or daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. And so we see foolishness. And again, what happens when, when Israel worships other gods? Well, look at Jephthah, Jephthah's family. His dad is with a prostitute and has this son out of wedlock and yet has sons from uh, his wife, although we're not given any details on that. And so then that causes family strife. And then Jephthah says dumb things, makes a dumb promise to God. And now God has blessed him with one daughter and now he has made this promise my father verse 36 she replied you have given your word to the lord 
Do to me as you have promised. Now the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. You may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. Uh, from, the corners of the, uh, uh, from this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. And so typical of this sinful time that Israel was in, you have God providing victory, and even the judge whom he uses, whom his spirit is upon, makes bad choices and dumb decisions. And the result of them is, in this case, that he sacrifices his own daughter, something the Lord had never asked. But it's important that we understand what Jephthah does and the oppression of the Ammonites that we're talking about now because we're going to learn a little more about the Ammonites and sort of how this all fits together. And again, sadly, we're going to turn to the life of King Solomon, just like we did with the, with the Moabites. And again, the Moabites and the Ammonites are often together in Scripture. Both are descendants from Lot. And, and so it's not really a surprise that uh, we go to King Solomon and we're going to see again um, something from the, the Ammonites that'll, uh, that'll help us to understand a little more as to who they are and shed a little bit of light on this terrible oath that Jephthah made, uh, even as a judge for the Lord or as a deliverer for the Lord. So 1 Kings chapter 11, the same passage we looked at last time with Moab, uh, uh, when we were studying Moab, we want to look at that same passage uh, uh, again and see uh, what the Lord is saying here through um, the life of Solomon. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 1, Then uh, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. And it says besides Pharaoh's daughter because Pharaoh had given his daughter first. That was sort of his first wife. And then um, it took off from there. Moabites, Ammonites, the people we're talking about, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. And again, because we've spent some time looking at the Moabites and looking at the Ammonites, and our next time together we're going to look at the Edomites and the Sidonians are part of the Phoenicians and we've looked at them, we can see that it isn't really a surprise that there's an Ahab and a Jezebel later in history because Solomon had been marrying all these different women from all these different nations and embracing their gods. And so in some ways, Ahab and Jezebel, the very people that, that uh, Elijah is opposing, is very much a result of King Solomon and his sin. He gives birth to all this oppression that, that is carried through First and Second Kings and ultimately uh, retold in First and Second Chronicles. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them, his foreign wives, in love. And he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. Before we read it, it's about to get worse, but notice what foreign gods do. Foreign gods are never, hey, we love the one true God, plus you can love us as well. It's never a both and. The foreign God is always evil and always turns the heart away from God. So God, when we look at the gods of the nations, the one true God is singularly unique, that he is loving and righteous, that he rescues and saves, as we saw from the instance in the book of Judges. Now listen to what happened. Solomon, verse 5, he, Solomon, followed Ashereth, the goddess of the Sidonians, or the Phoenicians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as his father had done. He followed, notice in verse 5, Molech, not merely the God of the Ammonites, the detestable God. And this is where Israel will begin to sink to the lowest of low. Molech 
was this God who the uh, Amor- uh, Ammonites worshipped, ultimately the Moabites, the Canaanites, and all the people uh, at different times worshipped Molech. And Molech was the God of child sacrifice. That is, he could give you life in their minds if you gave him life. And so Solomon is going to introduce the practice of Molech worship into Israel, and it's going to get to its lowest low later in Israel's history under Manasseh, who will be uh, worshiping Molech at the time of the prophet Isaiah, at the end of Isaiah's life. And we'll look at that in just a moment. So Molech is the god of the Ammonites. He is called detestable, and that's very important. He's never just the god. He is uniquely detestable in light of what he does. You can kind of see the image there that's, uh, that's drawn. Uh, the idea of this statue with the arms out like this, they would build a fire under the arms, and so this would be a metal, uh, some type of metal arms that they would have uh, like this with a fire under it, and those arms would get red hot or white hot and they would literally take infants and lay them and they would be incinerated instantly from the fire underneath and that was considered worship. That's what it was like to worship the other gods. And so the Ammonites introduce Molech or Solomon uh, introduces Molech because he marries Ammonite women along with Moabite women and Sidonian women, etc., etc. And so this gets introduced And it's very clear, Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, talked briefly about that last time, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives. And he burned incense and offered sacrifices to their God. Verse 9, Then the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. And it goes on. And and so God, because of Solomon marrying foreign wives and allowing his heart to turn to other gods, God will now rip the rip the kingdom from Solomon and really the kingdom of David gets just a token tribe the tribe of Judah and all the other tribes are going to become part of another kingdom ultimately the kingdom of the north or the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom will divide because of the gods because of Solomon's marriages because he did not follow the Lord his heart was not completely turned that way one more instance the lowest of the low when we think of the Ammonites we think of Molech They worshipped Chemosh as well, the god of the Moabites, but they had their own god, Molech. We think of him, and this is, if you will, the lowest of the low. 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings 23. In this case, the author of uh, 2 Kings very well could be Jeremiah. It's by uh, Jewish tradition that Jeremiah was the uh, author of... um, uh, first and second kings. Uh, so it could be him, but we're seeing Josiah. Josiah, the kingdom is divided north and south, Judah and Israel. And, and so we're looking at Josiah, who's the king of Judah. We're looking at the southern king who's now trying to lead a revival. He's a godly man, a godly king, and trying to lead them back to the one true God. So briefly, here's what Josiah is trying to do to make things right. Verse 10, he desecrated Topeth, which is in the valley of Ben-Hinnon, so that no one could sacrifice their son or daughters in the fire to Molech. So Josiah is trying to rid the south of Molech worship. And so he destroys and desecrates this particular location. Verse 11, he removed from the entrance to the temple of the Lord the horses that the kings of Judah dedicated to the sun. They had horses dedicated to worshiping the sun. They were in the court near the room of the official named Nathan Malek. Josiah then burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. He pulled down the altars of the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz and the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. Literally, you have idolatry in the very temple of the Lord. And that's what we're seeing Josiah is removing and trying to restore the worship of the Lord. He removed from there and smashed them to pieces and threw the rubble into the Kidron Valley. 
The king also desecrated the high places that were uh, east of Jerusalem on the southern hill of corruption, the one the ones Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Asherah, the vile goddess of the Sidonians, and Chemosh, the vile god, uh, god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. Did you catch that? So Solomon builds the high place to worship Chemosh, to worship Molech, in 1 Kings 11. And in 2 Kings 23, Josiah tears it down. So for all that time in Jerusalem, on that eastern hill, they were worshiping these pagan gods and sacrificing their children. Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the sites with human bones. Even the altar at Bethel, the high place made by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had caused Israel to send even that altar in the high place he demolished. He burned the high places to the ground, uh, burned the high places and ground it to powder and burned the Asherah pole as well. Then Josiah looked around and when he saw the tombs that were on the hillside, he had the bones removed from them and burned on the altar to defile it in accordance with the word the Lord had proclaimed through the man of God who foretold these things. And so when we talk about the gods, we're not just talking about, well, these people, they like him, and these people, they worship him. It's never neutral. It's vile and evil, and it always pulls away from the one true God. And so the Ammonites, in some ways, are, we're sort of building to the zenith of how bad it gets. And the Ammonites and their god, Molech, mark the lowest of the low, something that King Solomon introduced in the marriage of uh, all these foreign women that he was forbidden to marry, including the uh, women from Ammon, the Ammonites, and the beginning of the worship of Molech, all the way till Josiah tears those places down. So it goes without saying that worshiping the one true God is the God of life, and worshiping the gods of the nations is the God of death. Our next time together, we'll look at Edom and Edom and Moab and Ammon all kind of go together in what they do, and that'll bring us uh, to our last class together in which we'll sort of wrap it all up and bring it all to a close.